All right. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lord, we come to you this day joyful that we can study your holy word freely and that we would take some time now to be able to understand better Paul's letter to the Philippians. Lord, we pray that as we study, you would also speak to each of us in our own hearts with the message that you would have specifically for us to hear this day. All in the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. All right, let me do uh, a little summary. We were kind of going through an overview of Paul's uh, letter to the Philippians, and we didn't actually even get into the letter last week. We will today. Uh, but let me just sort of summarize again the overview. It's kind of good to get the big picture, uh, I think, of, of, of the situation uh, before we dive into the details of the, the letter itself. We remember that Paul is, uh, is writing this in prison, from prison, and we think that prison is somewhere uh, probably in Ephesus or somewhere near there. And uh, he's writing back to the church over in Philippi. If you'll remember, the Philippians uh, had sent him money. Because once you're in prison, you need help and support from other people. You need them to bring your food and your clothing and take care of any basic needs that you have. And so uh, somehow the Philippians found out about him being there and they send him some money. And he's writing a letter back in order to thank them for, uh, for sending him some support. Um. And then he tells them a bit in the letter about how he's doing and what he's doing and kind of what his own personal situation is. And he goes on and expounds a bit about what it means uh, to live for Jesus in and amongst a world that doesn't really understand it. Uh, he lives in that kind of world. He knows the Philippians do too. And so he kind of uh, takes some time to talk about that and how do you live for Christ in a culture that you know doesn't understand what you're all about. Um, one of the interesting things is that he will talk about celebrating even while he is in prison. Um, anytime someone goes to prison, for the most part, um, you tend to lose social status when you go to prison. I don't don't know if any of you have ever been in prison, but if uh, I'm guessing not. But if you go to prison, you don't go around uh, bragging about it. You don't really, you, you would like it to be something you and everybody else would just forget and put behind you. But Paul doesn't seem to, to look at it that way at all. I mean, it was no different in his day, but he doesn't look at it like that. He almost seems to relish this idea uh, of being in prison and suffering for the gospel. And he makes this point, and you'll see as we get into it, that life is something we celebrate no matter what the situation is that we find ourselves in. Uh, that he is celebrating even though he's imprisoned, and the Philippians should be celebrating to their life, and it's all because they now know the crucified Messiah. They now know Jesus, the Messiah has come. Everyone's life is now completely different. And so it should all be couched within uh, the idea of celebration, even if you're in a situation like prison. So he focuses quite a bit, Paul does, on Jesus as the one true God and how that true God has been revealed through Jesus the Messiah. He also talks about a theme, uh, this theme of being in partnership. And you'll see, we'll get into some of this today. Uh, partnership. He uses a Greek word, which uh, is koinonia. And we tend to use that in the church, koinonia, as fellowship. Some churches call their small groups koinonia groups, fellowship groups. But that word koinonia is, is more than fellowship. It's, more, it's deeper. It has more of a commitment. 
it's a partnership. That would be the proper way to, uh, I think, to translate that into English. It would be a word that would be used in Paul's day for a business partnership, that we have a business that we are in. We have an endeavor that we are in together, and we all have our parts to play, and we support each other in that partnership. We'll get into more of that, but that's a big theme for him, and this idea that we are all together playing our own parts to accomplish something larger. Um, that thing that we're trying to achieve for him is to declare Jesus as Lord and the truth of Jesus as Messiah and his message, his gospel. That's the endeavor that we're all in partnership. He was in partnership with the Philippians in carrying out that goal, that message. Um, so he has several main emphasis to his letter. He first asks the Philippians to think of themselves as a single, united community. He's not interested in having them separate based on customs, background. There was very early in the church a natural splitting that started to happen between those who were Jews and those who were Gentiles coming together. At first, they couldn't understand how, the Jews could not understand how Gentiles could be there too. Paul has already addressed all that as he, every church he plants, he makes clear that Jews and Gentiles are called. So those that are there kind of understand that as the goal, but it's still, we're so different. And so you can imagine little groups and little cliques within the church. And then they started to meet in different places. The Jews would meet here in this house. The Gentiles would meet over in this place. It was just so hard for people who seem so different and who have lived for generations like the Jews separating themselves from Gentiles. It was a sin to be with those people. Now to invite them into the fellowship. And so Paul, he addresses this, that he expects and that the gospel calls us together in unity, all based around Jesus. That was a, that was a message that was far easier to say than to live out. But that's an overriding message for Paul, that the messianic world, the world now that Jesus came, no longer has these ways of differentiating people by ethnicity or race or what religion you grew up with. Those things were all out the window. So when he says living in the world after the Messiah came and he says the world is completely different now, that's a primary way that he means that, is that people who, know, who would never get together before now come together in Christ. And then he appeals to them to live lives of holiness. And you'll see that in, in chapter two, we'll get into, he actually wrote a poem uh, in there. It doesn't come across to us as poetry, but it was for them. It's poetry if you read it in, in, in Greek. And he's saying that, uh, as a united people in Christ, we're called to live a radically different way than the rest of the world does. And that's what he calls, that's holiness. Not only are we to be united, but we're also supposed to be people living lives of holiness. And he talks about that. So he wants them and he, he encourages them to be this united and holy community in the face of of a pagan secular culture that surrounds them, that they are to be this united, holy people, even though they're in a position where they are surrounded by and having to deal day to day with a variety of pagan and secular people and cultures around them. Avoiding, they need to avoid the dangerous habits of those ways of life. Those ways of life are going to be temptations and they're going to need to struggle and work to not get called into that kind of life. 
Truth is, unity is easy if you don't call for holiness. And holiness is easy if you don't care about unity. It's easy to be friendly with one another and to be united if you don't care about holiness, if you don't care how anybody else behaves. If I don't care how you behave, I can get along with you better. If I don't care about any of the things you say or do, I can get along. It's easy to say we're going to be holy if when there's disagreement, we just go our separate ways. You see, so it's easy to be holy if I don't care about unity. It's easy to be holy, and if I don't like the way you're living or the things that you're saying, we just go our separate ways. Unity and holiness are hard when you try to put them together because it says that if I don't like what I see, I don't just walk away. We work together to find a way through that. And if we're going to be united, uh, we're going to support each other in that, recognizing each other as people with lots of faults and sinners. We're going to find a way through that. That's what unity means. In holiness, simply means that we're going to find that, we're going to live that way. We're going to strive to live that way. We're not going to just ignore one another's behavior, nor are we just going to go the other way if we don't like what we see. So that's a whole different way of thinking about life. The whole culture didn't see life that way. <laughs> if I don't like what's happening, I leave. If, you know, if I want to get along with you, I don't, I don't have, I, I don't have, I can't pay any attention to how, how you live your life, what you say or do, because as soon as that's going to happen, disunity is going to come in. He's saying, no, you've got to be focused on both. That's hard. So this letter in Paul's thinking is about a whole new way of living and thinking, living differently, loving differently, because we now know God differently, because Jesus came. We know God in a whole new way than we did back in the days of the Old Testament. Jesus presented to us a whole different way of understanding who God is. And so because we now know him differently than we used to, then we need to be living differently, loving differently. Essentially, we need to be different kinds of people all because of that. And so for him, suffering and celebrating are all part of that. Suffering and celebrating all go together for him. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's whether we're suffering or whether we're celebrating, it doesn't, doesn't matter because we're all doing it while we're focused on Jesus. And that's all that matters to him. So that's the overview. That's kind of uh, the major points he tries to make um, in this letter. Before we dive into it, any, any thoughts or comments, anything that, or question, anything that comes to mind? I have a, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Um, what if only one person is interested in working towards holiness and unity? You mean... I mean, that's a call to the church. And you're saying if... You know, like, say you and I disagree about something. I, I want to work on it, try to find a way, you know, using by holiness and unity for us. Oh. Instead of walking away from you. Yeah. You know, I, I want to try to figure out a way to work through it. But say you don't. You've no interest in it. Doesn't work, does it? You're not going to change. So that's, I mean, that's, there's not really anything you can do. Nope, doesn't, doesn't work. Paul's, Paul's encouragement and the assumption is that to be the church effectively, everybody needs to be of that mind. Now, he's also a realist. He knows that doesn't, that doesn't change in a moment's notice. And he understands, I'm sure, the challenge that, that he's placing before these folks. And what he's saying is that's the goal to which we should all be working. Obviously, we're never going to be fully united or fully holy until Christ comes again and, and renews us all in full. 
But in the meantime, that's the goal that we strive to. And there are going to certainly be folks who are not going to be comfortable with that, just not going to be able to do it. And, and that, will, uh, that will be unfortunate for them, and it's unfortunate for the church. But that's the goal to which the church, in his view, should be, should be focused. And that should be where we're headed. That's, the, that was what, that's what progress for a church looks like, how united we've become, how holy we become in the way we live. Does that answer it? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Let's take a look then at, uh, we're going to look at the first 11 verses and, uh, and go into that. Uh, I'm going to put them on the screen. You can certainly uh, follow in your own Bible or make notes if you like, but I'd like us to work for the most part from the same translation. Everybody see it? Yep. Yep. All right. Um, somebody want to read those first two verses? Paul and Timothy. Go ahead, Melissa. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's, uh, let's pick up and do, uh, do from 3 through 7. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right to me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. And somebody want to finish 8 through 11? For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that you love, your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. To the glory and praise of God. Okay, uh, so let's go back through this. First of all, it's uh, we have to always remind ourselves this isn't um, we're not reading a narrative, we're not reading a story that someone wrote. We're not reading a, a historical uh, book. We're reading a letter. This is Paul sitting on a cold, damp dungy floor in a dark basement jail and somebody sitting with him likely writing for him as he speaks <clears throat> uh, this may have been somebody who was able to get near him and sit with him it could be somebody who was outside a small window writing as Paul talked we don't know how these letters got composed Later on, he tells us, though, who helped him write it and who delivered it. But we have to put ourselves in that framework and understand this is like picking up, you know, a letter from, you know, your grandmother that she wrote years and years ago to someone and seeing firsthand and hearing about their life, how they were feeling uh, and their, what they're trying to communicate to other people that they cared about. And so it's a letter. And so that's the beginning. And Paul is thanking and praising God. And he's praying for the people of this small fledgling church in Philippi. And he starts most letters like this. Um, he 
mentions his young assistant, Timothy, who may well be the person who, if they're not the one writing this, will be the one perhaps delivering it. And a letter this dense, as you'll see, it needs explaining. And so whoever was going to now take this letter and deliver it to the leaders at, um, at Philippi, at the church, and they would probably be invited to come into the church, uh, into the gathering, and to read it. And then they would be expected to be able to explain it. There could be two different people that this could be. It could be Timothy, and then there's another person later that Paul talks about, Epaphroditus. And it sounds like one or both of them would be taking the letter. And as this letter would be read, then they would be expected to field questions and expand on the message uh, to the congregation. Uh, what did Paul mean by this? And what is he talking about here? and they would ask for clarification. So whoever takes it also is prepared to, tell, to talk more about it and to answer some things. He describes them as, we're still in verse one, servants, or it's the same word that would be used for slaves of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. And you know, it, it Sometimes it's interesting the way we see the name Jesus used. You know, in our, in our world, it's so often uh, easy to think of Jesus Christ as um, his, his first name and last name, a surname, Jesus Christ, his last name. And of course it's not. It's Jesus the Christus, Jesus the Messiah. So sometimes it's actually used backwards uh, in our gospels and in Paul's letters. And when we see Christ, we should always think Messiah. That's what it means. So servants of the Messiah, Jesus, is what he's saying. And he's saying that we are slaves. Now again, like I, I said, being in prison was never something you would brag or take pride in. And it was the same thing about being a slave. Uh, being a slave was not something that you held with pride, you kept it quiet, you hid it. People probably knew, but it wasn't something certainly that you wanted to jump up and down and shout out. But it's important to see that Paul has his own identity completely turned inside out. And he, it's the first thing he mentions, and it comes to him as a moment of pride to be a slave or a servant of the Messiah Jesus. And so it's, it's, again, it's a flip of what you expect in the culture, right? Where you would expect someone to be ashamed to be a slave or to be at the lowest level of individual, a servant in a community. He sets that as his primary identity. Paul and Timothy, servants or slaves, of the Messiah, just the same way somebody would say their occupation or who they are, what they are when they introduce themselves, that's the way he introduces them as slaves or servants. There's this whole notion as we go through the letter of this status reversal, right? That being in prison instead of it just being a, a, a thing of suffering, it's a time of celebration. Here, in being a slave or a servant, instead of being something of which one might be ashamed, instead, it's something of which to be proud. This reversal of status comes up again and again to Paul, in Paul. He goes on then, and he says, um, he writes to God, he's writing to God's people, and he's saying that He's addressing it to the overseers and the deacons. So even at this very early days of the church, this would have been written in probably, we said, around 57 AD. So, you know, the church is 14 or 15 years old now since Jesus died, rose, and ascended into heaven. 
and Pentecost came. So it's still very young, but already now there's, an, there's some structure within the church. There are overseers. There are people who are in charge. Uh, they would be people who might teach or preach. Uh, they would be the ones who would arrange for the meetings to happen and where they're going to happen. Oftentimes, it might have been down at the river, at the river's edge. Other times, maybe, you know, it's a dangerous place for us and we're going to meet in a home or wherever. And there were deacons. And deacons were always, from the very beginning, Stephen, the first deacon, their role was to care for those in the congregation who were in need. They had pure servant ministries. And initially it was to widows and orphans, but it expanded quickly to anyone who had specific needs. So immediately the congregations cared for one another and whatever the basic needs would be of those people. And so already we have this kind of structure, 14, 15 years uh, into the church. And even the church in Philippi wouldn't be that old uh, at all. So it's, it's even younger because it wasn't formed immediately uh, upon Christ's ascension. It was only after Paul finally got there. So even in an early stage, it had a structure, roles and ministers. He says, grace to you and peace. And for Paul, uh, that's not a casual greeting. Um, it's a statement about God, and it's a statement that the transforming grace of Jesus results in peace. As you read Paul, grace leads to peace. God's graciousness, God's mercy, God's love for us, God's care for us, all those things that we, we, we roll into that single word grace is what leads us into peace. And so he's, he's simply stating that as a greeting, that his hope is that, and his prayer is that God's grace and all that God, uh, all that they mean to God will lead to peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He immediately links those two. So it's really important to Paul to, for everyone to understand that God the Father, who we know so well throughout all of the Old Testament times, we now link him to Jesus Christ. They're now one and the same. We saw him. We saw what God looks like when Jesus walked this earth. And so he goes on into those next several verses, three to six, and these are his thanksgivings. So he always likes to start with thanksgivings. <clears throat> and what are some of the things that he's thankful for? <clears throat> Yeah, his, his very memory of them. He thanks God for his memories of them. In all my remembrances of you, I'm thankful when I think about you and I remember you. You see, I was talking last week about how this is such a joyful letter because uh, it almost seems like this is his favorite church. They didn't seem to experience all the deep problems of places like Corinth. Uh, and so he, he is very pleased by their memory, and he thanks God for that. Um, what else does he say about them? They are partakers of grace with him. There's that whole point of partnership again, right? That they are partaking uh, with him in this grace. And every prayer of his He's making with joy in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. So that's that whole point again. That he, it's, a, it's a very joyful letter, thinking about them, writing to them, uh, praying for them is a cause of joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. 
So there's that partaking, this partnership that uses that word koinonia, this business partnership. So it's the gospel message is not just it's not just a change that's made in the life of individuals, but this is actually a force, an energy that is out there transforming communities. There's, there's more to this than just what happens in my heart. <clears throat> it's, actu <clears throat> it's actually about changing the world and communities. It's a force, it's an energy that comes with it. This gospel message, you see, it takes a partnership. It is something that needs to be lived, but it also has to be promoted. And we are in partnership to make this happen. And they sent him money in prison. They sent his love. They're in fellowship with him. That's all part of our partnership, of the work that we have to do, changing the world, spreading this gospel message that the Messiah has come. We're all in this together. And part of it is supporting one another. We need to lift one another up in the midst of this work that we are in partnership to do. Then in verse 6, Then I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it is often spoken of, particularly in the prophets, of the coming of the day of the Lord. The coming of the day of the Lord. And that meant to the Old Testament people of God that there would be a day when the Messiah would come. And it would be a day when the Messiah not only would come, but would make the world over that all that was wrong would be made right. And they understood this as being a single thing that was going to happen all at one time. The Messiah would come. The Messiah would change the entire world. The Messiah would, uh, would call his people together, and all that was wrong would be made right. That's the day of the Lord. And now Paul is saying that that, is represented in Jesus. But he defines the day of the Lord differently. He defines it as a day, the day of the Lord, but he defines it as coming in two parts. Okay? Those that, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of of Jesus Christ. He who began the good work, Jesus, is going to bring it to completion. So he sees it as two parts. The first coming of Jesus is where the good work in you began. His life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, all of that. The world is now in a different place because of it. God is now known completely differently than anyone has known him before, like in the Old Testament days. But there will be a second coming when through Jesus, God is going to finally do what God said he would do back in the Old Testament scriptures, putting the whole world right at last. So there's this vision that it's begun, Jesus came, he has done a good work in you, but it's not done. It's not finished. It will be completed when he comes again. So it's this, you know, he's expounding this kind of cosmic vision of the world. Um, a universe, all creation, put right when Jesus comes again. It started with Jesus when he came the first time, it's only going to be fulfilled the second time. And he takes it... Man, I keep getting phone calls here. And 
he sees it as something that's going to happen to the entire world, the entire universe, this cosmic vision, but it's also the same with you and me. He brings it right down to that same work happening in an individual's heart. That who began a good work in you, an individual, will bring it to completion in you, an individual person, when Jesus Christ comes again. So it's not just the entire universe and world that everything wrong in it will be made right. It will happen to each person too, each individual. The one who's, who the gospel and the Holy Spirit is working in you and giving you new life, that Holy Spirit will continue working in you until it's completed on the day of Jesus Christ. It's really, it's really quite profound what he's proclaiming here to them. And you can understand that when this letter would be read to them by Timothy or Epaphroditus, there would be lots of questions. What exactly are you saying here? Uh, tell us more about what that actually means. Paul doesn't mention the Holy Spirit here. He doesn't mention the Holy Spirit very much in this letter at all. I don't think at all. But he expounds on the Holy Spirit quite a lot in some of his other letters. And he's implying it here. This work that has been done in you that is being moved to completion the day of Jesus Christ, that's what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts. He is constantly shaping us, remolding us into more and more the image of Jesus and it will only be complete at the end. Let me pause there for a minute and just see if there are thoughts or questions that anybody has. There's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot there. Is that making sense? A little bit. I know when I first read through this a couple of weeks ago, before last week's Bible study, I thought, what? Right. <laughs> I, don't know that, I don't know that I got the point of this. Like, what? I don't, I don't get it. And then after last week, I thought, oh, all right. Well, okay, now I have some context in which to put yeah, but, right. Yeah, so nobody is, I mean, none of us are ever complete. None of us will ever be complete until the second coming, basically. That's right. What he's saying. That's like, right. You don't ever work really hard most of your life and think, hey, I made it. <laughs> I'm good. I'm here. No matter what, we have to continue to keep working. Yeah, and he, he is working in us, and we are allowing that work to happen. And because of the free will we have, we can, we can put that work on pause if we want. We can say, I'm not going there. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not cooperating with that. I'm not changing that way. And we can put it on pause. Uh, on the other hand, when we cooperate with him, he continues to mold and shape us every single day right up to our very last breath. And so that renewal that's going to come at the end is a renewal of everything. And indeed, it's even a reversal of what was wrong in some ways that we cannot understand, right? Things that are wrong now will be made right. Horrible things that we have seen happen in the world will be made right at that time. Everything about us will be made right. All the flaws of our failable bodies will all be made right. We'll be renewed with our body, but it'll be a renewed body. So when people saw Jesus after the resurrection, they could tell it was him, but they weren't sure it was him. And first they didn't know it was him. And then to think, I think that's him. And then later they say, of course it's him. We get it, but, and we wonder, well, why didn't you, couldn't you tell? Why didn't he, does, they couldn't tell it was him. He didn't look the same. And then once they talked to him, they realized who he was. Oh, when he took bread and he broke it at the table, then we, we realized who he was. When he called us over to the shoreline and he was cooking fish on a little, on, on a little charcoal fire uh, after the resurrection, then we realized who that guy was there on the shore once he did that and called us over. 
So there's a renewal of everything, body, mind, and spirit, and everything else, the world, nature, the universe, all gets made right at the second coming. It's not that we go to heaven, heaven comes to us. All of this becomes part of heaven at the second coming. That's really profound stuff that Paul is explaining to us here. He's taking what, you know, we heard Jesus say and he's laying it all out and explaining to us in great detail the things that Jesus would just make simple references to. Paul's explaining it all in a way that's still really hard to grasp for us who live in a, you know, a simple three-dimensional world. Is it making sense? Kind of has to kind of has to sink in a bit. And so yeah, there's two parts of this, and that's why we still struggle today. He's working in us, he's changing us. We see what what happens to people and to us whenever we allow him to work in our lives. And we can say that, but he's never done either. Never done until we're, we're going to be done. So we're, we're, we're filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Yep, that's right. Let me go on just a little more and then we'll, we'll break because I think it's a, it, it would be a better place to stop if we continue a little. Let me go back to my text here. Okay, let's see here. Paul goes on now, and he talks to them about why they are so special. And this is really unusual language to hear in any uh, ancient writings. People just didn't write things like this. This would be something you know your grandmother might write to you but this is not something people wrote in those days he says something and he says it to no other church than this one he says he holds them in his heart because you are partakers with me the partners with them with him in grace i hold you in my heart for you are the partakers both in my imprisonment and in defense of the confirmation of the gospel. It doesn't matter where I am. I hold you in my heart because we're still partners in this grand task that we have taken on. We are partners in it, regardless of where I happen to be. This notion holds them in his heart. It, it's this deep sense of affection for the Philippian people. Uh, it's a deep bond uh, the language that he's using. It's the kind of language that would only be used between two very, very good friends, perhaps a brother and a sister or, or, or in, within a family. And because they're partners, they care for him in prison and they love him and he's saying that he loves them. And he says that he would hope that their love might abound more and more, just be overflowing, abounding and overflowing with knowledge and discernment. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. Your love is overflowing, your love for one another, and that it would be with knowledge and discernment. So, this is a place now where, and, and I'll do this and then we'll, we'll close. So let me come out of this again. Can, we can see one another. He's calling this diverse group of people together and to love one another. You know, I talked about this last week. You, you can't make the point, I don't think, emphatic enough that these are really different people from one another that are together in this church. It's not just this little group of Jews. It's not just this little group of Gentiles. It's Jews and Greeks 
and Gentiles and Romans and non-Romans, rich and poor, foreigners, locals from Philippi, they were all in that city. This was a very diverse city. It'd be like going into you know, the middle of New York and forming a church in Manhattan and you were gonna find lots of different kinds of people. And he's saying that they need to be able to love one another as they love him and he loves them. It's creating this whole new community around love based on Jesus. Um, and it's not just this easygoing kind of love, but he says it should go with knowledge and discernment. Another way to translate that knowledge and discernment is astute wisdom. With astute wisdom. And he links these two things, knowledge and discernment, the same way he linked unity and holiness. He sees them as having to come together. So unity and holiness and love with knowledge and discernment. And that was important, knowledge and discernment. Why? Because it would, it would be the way they would discern good from evil. You need knowledge and discernment to know good from evil. And for those early Christians, it was really hard. It was really hard to learn that there's this whole new way to decide what is appropriate way to live and behave and what is not. They came from, you know, a, a, many of them from a pagan world where anything went, any kind of lifestyle choices made no difference. Jews came from this very rigid set of laws which told them to pay no attention to anybody else and, and, and be, be careful to stay away from anybody not like you. And he's saying, you need wisdom and discern or knowledge and discernment. You need astute wisdom to be able to sort through all that and understand now there's a new set of morals and standards about how we behave as people of the Messiah. Had to be a huge shock to these people to try and integrate this into their life. This was a major life change. You know, for us who grew up in, you know, a, a world and a society that still, whether we, whether we think it's still the same or not, it was largely defined by Judeo-Christian principles and ethics. You know, being a Christian wasn't a big shift. For these people, this was a major shift in the way you lived. It was gonna mean you were gonna have a lot to explain to your friends and family because they were not gonna understand why you live like this when the rest of the world lives in a very different way. It didn't matter whether you're going back to your Orthodox Jewish family or you were going to your Gentile pagan family, it didn't matter. You were gonna look real different to both of them. And so how you think you see, is a big theme for Paul. And we'll, we'll close there and we'll pick up there next week. It was a complete change of thinking that would then result in a complete change in behavior. Get your thinking changed and you'll behave differently in all of this because the Messiah has come. And we now know what the one true God of the universe is really like. Thoughts? We can dig uh, in. So, Go ahead. What, what made Paul write to the Philippians? Um, you know, was he just sitting around one day and thought, hmm, I think I'll write a letter to the Philippians? No, he, he was answering them because they sent him money. So it started out, the purpose of the letter no, was to, no, th just to thank no. them. Yep. These, okay. pe these people took the time to save up money, send it on to him, get it to him, and he wanted the right to thank them, and in doing so, tell them a little bit about himself, but also continue to encourage them even more deeply into what the gospel is about. And he always does that in his letters, right? He, he gives a lot of kind of, here's what's going on, but then it's always, he takes the message of the gospel and he he puts it in, either emphasizes it again, or he takes it and goes even deeper 
and, and, and adds even more detail and more twists and turns to what the gospel was really about. See, it's Paul that really explains what the gospel means. Jesus lived it. Paul tells us what it at all meant. All right, we'll take some time uh, at the beginning next week to uh, just go back through a little bit of that and make sure we're kind of all on the same page. Um, think about it over time. Pray a little bit over some of these words as well. Uh, see what the message is to you. And then we'll, uh, we'll pick up there next Wednesday, same time, same place. Okay? All right. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat>